mission that's taking place in those guys. Today, then, is the fourth Sunday of the Epiphany. And the epistle is taken from Romans chapter 13. Beloved, owe no man anything except to love one another. For he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. For thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Thou shalt not covet. And if there is any other commandment, it is summed up in this saying. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Love does no evil to a neighbor. Love, therefore, is the fulfillment of the law. You may stand for the Holy Gospel. Taken from St. Matthew, chapter 8. At that time, Jesus got into a boat, and his disciples followed him. And behold, there arose a great storm on the sea, so that the boat was covered by waters. But he was asleep. So his disciples came to him and woke him, saying, Lord, save us, we are perishing. But Jesus said to them, Why are you fearful, O you of little faith? Then he arose and rebuked the wind and the sea, and there came a great calm. The men marveled, saying, What manner of man is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? Thus far the words of the Holy Ghost. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, Amen. Dear Reverend Father, you're faithful. I wanted to continue this Sunday in a series of sermons on the Mass of all times. And you remember last week, for those who were here, we spoke about the altar, the importance of that altar, and its symbolism. Why now we have the altar cloth there? Why the relics are buried in the altar? Why the candles? Why the flowers? These aren't just the bells and smells of traditional Catholicism, right? Our altars must be decorated properly. It must be against the wall hopefully facing east, because this is, not a, this is not just a meal, which is offered on a common table in the middle of the sanctuary that you will see in Catholic churches all over. No, the Mass is so much more. The reason that crucifix is up there, we said why it's there, why it must be there, is to remind us that this Mass is essentially a sacrifice. And our Lord, in all of His wisdom, knew what He was doing. When on the Last Supper, He told us, <coughs> To do this until the end of time, unto the remission of sin. Because he, he was teaching us that our sufferings in the future, all of our pain in this life had a purpose. It was for the remission of sin in reparation to the offenses given to his heavenly Father. And that is why, dear friends, we are here this morning, gathered together in our church. And that is why we're here every morning, in fact, and every Sunday, because we love our Mass. And today I wanted to do the prayers at the foot of the altar. So we can begin then with a story. There was a young man named Joe Murray. He was a Catholic college student. And he graduated from St. Joseph's College in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And Joe, during the battle of the, the, the World War II, during the Battle of the Bulge, he was appointed as the man that checked all the officers who entered the camp. So he would check their paperwork to make sure that everything was in order. And one day, a driver pulled up in a military jeep wearing the uniform of an American chaplain. The driver was a Catholic priest, he said. And so Joe asked for his papers, as was customary. Everything looked in order. Everything looked normal. However, there was just a, a bad feeling in Joe's stomach as he looked at this man. Catholic priest, he thought. Well, I'll pose him a question. Surely he'll know the answer if he is a Catholic priest. And so Joe looked at him and said, Father, what's the response? In The man was speechless. He was not a chaplain. He, in fact, was a German spy. Any Catholic priest would have immediately answered, A day in Pitititica, you've entered the man. Those, dear friends, are the prayers that open this holy mass. I will go unto the altar of God, unto God who give joy to my youth. I really pray, and all the priests pray, and all of you know this prayer by heart. Just last week, I stopped into the classroom here behind to visit the seventh and eighth graders while Mr. Kane was doing an altar boy prayer. And it was, it was a great uh, moment to see all the boys gathered there. 
And to say those words, and to hear their response, this coming from 7th and 8th grade boys, right? And to go through the prayers at the foot of the altar. And so let us go through the prayers at the foot of the altar. You know who wrote this psalm? Which is Psalm 42. It was written by King David, in fact. King David was one of the greatest men of the Old Testament, you might say, right next to Moses. Well, the story is quite a sad one, in fact, on the occasion of why he wrote this song. It was because his son, Absalom, who he loved dearly, turned upon him. And while he was king of the kingdom, Absalom secretly was winning people, the, the generals, the officers, the, the members of the court, he was winning them to himself in a plot to overthrow his father, the king. Well, David heard about this plot, and right before they captured him, King David flees and goes into exile. And so, while he is in exile, he is writing this song. You can imagine the emotion, just being betrayed by your own son, having your kingdom throw you out. What must have been the emotion going through David's heart, as now he was in exile? But the thing that made him the saddest while he's writing this song is that he longed for the courts of Jerusalem. He longed for the tabernacle. He longed for that place that he loved to pray. My dear friends, maybe there's something there that's similar for us as we long for eternity, as we're here this morning longing for the church to return. We too sometimes feel betrayed. We too sometimes have division in families, but just attending these things. So maybe we can enter the spirit of David, who while he was feeling these emotions, pain and sorrow, could not help but reflect upon his own sins. You know what David did. David fell. David committed adultery and then murder. And so all of this is on his mind. As he is in exile, he knows so much of this is due to even his own sins. Well, in this psalm he says, Judge me, O God, and distinguish my cause against an ungodly nation. Because his nation threw him out. Deliver me from the unjust and deceitful man. I wonder if he was referring to his son. And he says, Send forth thy light and thy truth. I will praise thee upon the harp, O my God. Why art thou sad, my soul? Hope thou in God, for I will yet praise him in the salvation of my continence, my God. Yes, for King David, the saddest thing is that he was longing to be back in the temple, where he could then enjoy the music of the liturgy, the beautiful decorations of the temple and the tabernacle. It's the same for us. We love our mass. We love our altars and our churches. And so let us, as though we are holding the harp in our hands, David, let us remember that when we begin this great prayer of the mass, that we have to have those emotions, those feelings as he did, as we long to go back to Jerusalem, to, the, to eternity, to paradise. This psalm is one of hope and joy. And for that reason, the prayers put of the altar, Psalm 42, is omitted in the Requiem Mass during Passion Time. And unfortunately, there are some Catholics who never seem to pray this psalm because they habitually arrive late to Mass. How sad that is. It's almost like a self-inflicted effort because I can't get up on time. One should resolve then to be at Mass early, even 15 minutes early. It's not too early. So that you can prepare for this great prelude to the Mass. And that way you don't come into the church out of breath, but with a clear mind and a body that's refreshed in order to enter now into these prayers. We can also see this morning, in addition to the prayers there in Psalm 42, we can also see the confidium. And the confidium, of course, is this public confession. It seems strange, perhaps that we would begin the Holy Mass with a public confession. There's told a story of a mother whose son uh, was killed while fighting for his country. When the dreadful news came to this poor mother from the war office, 
The mother was inconsolable. She collapsed. That her son, who was 24 years old, was killed in battle. And again and again, this mother kept wishing for just five more minutes. If I could just have five more minutes with my son. And later on, after the funeral, someone had asked her, what five minutes would you choose to have with your son? If you could. Would you want him when he was just a little baby? Five minutes. Would you want him the first day that he was going off to school? Just five minutes. Or would you rather have him at graduation that day, when he graduated with honors? Or when he was bravely running in the back? The mother said, no, none of those times. She said, I would rather have him for five minutes the day that he was a little boy. And he came running into the house from the yard to ask pardon for being naughty. He was so young and so sad, the woman said. He had tears in his eyes. And he threw himself so hard into my arms that it hurt. And so to that mother, the most memorable moment in her life of her little boy was when he was asking for forgiveness, for being disobedient towards her. <laughs> It is the same with Almighty God. Our moments of sorrow and contrition, dear friends, are the most precious moments of our lives in the eyes of God. It says in Scripture, Luke chapter 15, that there will be more joy in heaven on one sinner that repents than on 99 men who are just, who did not need repentance. The confidio that we open Mass with dates back to the 8th century or earlier. In it, we humbly, publicly, and contritely, we admit our guilt publicly for all to hear, for all to see. The Confidio is divided into two parts. The first part, wherein we confess our sins. The second part is when we ask for people around us to pray for us. I confess to Almighty God, to Blessed Mary, ever virgin, to Blessed Michael, <coughs> the Archangel. To blessed John the Baptist, to the holy apostles Peter and Paul. And here some priests in different religious orders are granted the privilege of adding their, the name of the saint to their order. And so to the Franciscans they say Father Francis, and the Benedictines they say Father Benedict. And then the priest strikes his breast three times and says, through my fault, through my fault, my most grievous fault. Therefore, he says again, I beseech the Blessed Mary ever virgin, Blessed Michael the Archangel, Blessed John the Baptist, the Holy Apostles Peter and Paul, and to all the saints. And then the priest says to all of you in the pews, and to you, my brethren, to pray to the Lord thy God for me. This is so beautiful at this moment, because the altar boy swings in, you know, is what he's supposed to. The altar boy swings in towards the priest. And the altar boy then says to the priest, We will pray for you. God will forgive you and bring you to life everlasting. That is so beautiful. To think that our faithful are praying for us through the lips, through the mouth of the young boy who is serving at the altar gives great consolation to the priest who is about to climb the altar as unworthy as he is. He needs your prayers to be pure in heart. Give his soul to Almighty God to offer the sacrifice on behalf of all souls. We pray, and it's not, it's not unfitting to mention the name of Mary in the Creed. For Mary is the mother of mercy and the refuge of sinners. And we mention Michael the Archangel because he's the head of the angels, the chief of the angels. And John the Baptist because he was the forerunner of Christ. And of course, Peter and Paul because they were the apostles of the early church, both of them martyred in Rome. Yes, as the priest bows low, you might say, he expresses with his body the sorrow of his soul. The bow is also meant to humble his soul. He joins his hand in recollection of mind and soul, and striking his breast three times, wherein lies the heart, which is the seat of good and evil. And the threefold striking of the breast reminds us that we have sinned in thought, that we have sinned in word, and that we have sinned in action. <clears throat> and 
Then, of course, the servers bow down. After the priest is confused, the servers themselves will bow down. At a high mass, the choir is usually singing during this time as the prayers for the altar are being recited. And now the priest will say these words. May Almighty God be merciful to you, he says to the altar boy, and forgive your sins and bring you to life everlasting. And then the priest, after you recite your confidier, he pronounces an absolution. May the Almighty and merciful Lord grant you pardon, absolution, of your sins. And that means, my dear friends, that if you have no mortal sins on your soul, at this moment you are forgiven of all your other sins. You attend Mass almost as clean as a little baptized baby. So we recommend then to each of you, dear friends, to always be praying the prayers at the foot of the altar from your pews. That when you hear the man kupa from the altar boy, that you also are striking your heart, saying the same to yourself, bowing your head even if you wish, the altar and in the pew, following along carefully in your missal. We say this, we say this every day, all of us to remind us that we are sinners, and that we sometimes feel like we are perishing, like the apostles in today's gospel, who cried out to our Lord, save us for we perish. May we be like little children then, and run before our Heavenly Father, just like the story that we told about the little boy that came in to his mother. In that moment, we can think of a prodigal son who ran into his father's arms and confessed that he had sinned against heaven and earth. We do this at the beginning of every Holy Mass. May we always remember that, to enter into this church, to enter into the Mass with humility. So dear friends, let us return to the altar and follow Father Alphonsus as he continues to offer the Mass at all time. In the name of the Father and of the Son,